When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. Yet I was, excuse me, excuse me. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king, because they refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities. It consumes their oracle priests and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. For the most high, to the most high they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adamah? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not, again, destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come to wrath. They shall go after the Lord who roars like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and the doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, says the Lord. This is God's good word for us, God's beloved people. Thanks be to God. Amen. So, When I was 17, my girlfriend lived two suburbs over. I don't know how familiar you are with the endless suburban sprawl that is the Houston area, Uh, but basically I lived um, in Champions. Um, She lived in Kleinbrook, and between us was Champion Forest. And so to get from my house to her house took... Uh, roughly um, 15 minutes. It's five miles. I actually looked this up on Google Maps uh, to make sure I had all of my numbers right. It took 15 minutes, not in traffic, um, to go from my house to her house or from her house to my house. That was a sum total of five miles, um, but the max speed limit on that route is like 35 or 40, and so it takes theoretically about 15 minutes to go from Champions Park North to Kleinbrook or from Kleinbrook to Champions Park North. You get the gist, right? 15-minute trip, all of five miles, can be done, no problem. And our curfews were usefully staggered because of the travel time. So her curfew was midnight. So if I drop her off at midnight, I should have no problem getting back by 1230, right? Do the math. I have 30 minutes in which to traverse a 15-minute journey. I only have to make it five miles in 30 minutes. Even in Houston rush hour traffic, you can often make it five miles in 30 minutes. I live eight miles from this church. In traffic, it takes me 20 minutes to get here. Out of traffic, it takes me about 12, right? This is all eminently doable math. So one night at about 1240, I was on my way uh, from my girlfriend's house to my house. Um, And I was, as I have just indicated, running badly late. I was running behind, to say the least. Um, And so the speed limit on Champion Forest Drive is 35 miles an hour, right? It just is. Um, It's 35 miles an hour. Uh, When the cop pulled me over, I was going, I believe, 72, Uh, which is, if you do the math in the back of your head, is more than 2x the speed limit. Cops generally don't care if you're a little over, but, like, when you're 2x the speed limit or more than 25 miles an hour over the speed limit, and I was both, you're heading for some real trouble. So I am now pulled over the side of the road, um, and the cop is coming towards me, um, and I know I'm hosed. I know that all hope has left the building, that just we are, nothing is happening, nothing good can come of this, this is over. And so I look 
real sad. Um, as I, you know, I, I think I had push, I think I had push button windows in that car. This might have been the crank window. We're going to do this motion because it's more dramatic. I roll down the window, um, and there is this cop. Um, and he looks at me and he goes, uh, you, what, do you, what do you think you got pulled over for? Um, and I went speeding, I guess. And who knows what is going through that cop's mind. But he lets me go. He let me go. He had me dead to rights, right? Like that's like go to jail kind of, like go to jail for the night um, kind of speeding. He let me go. I have no idea. I've never met that guy before. I've never seen him since, as far to my knowledge. But I got to let go. This thing that could have, you know, whatever, really impacted my life. That I definitely done wrong. Did I deserve to go to jail in that moment? Yeah, absolutely. Right? But I didn't. I got let go from this thing I definitely deserved. This might be the indication of where I'm going with this story, right? I remember the rush of relief I felt as I drove away. I did then recommit myself to righteousness. I'm not sure I made it, but I did at least in that moment recommit myself to righteousness, which felt like the right thing to do. Uh, thank you, Lord, for being set free from this sin. I will never speed again. Yeah, that didn't work out. But you know, you make those commits, important at least in the moment that you are set free uh, to make those commitments that you may or may not uphold. But that rush of relief of being set free from this thing that I did wrong, this lead weight that could have ruined my life, I just got let go from it. That feeling, that thing, that's our relationship with God, whether we recognize it or not, except on an even bigger scale. And that is certainly what's happening here in the prophet Hosea. Because why Hosea doesn't get used a whole lot in preaching is because the most of the prophet Hosea is not very nice. Hosea is not a nice guy because Hosea has some real not nice things to tell God's people. Um, he spends the first three chapters talking about his wildly unfaithful wife, Gomer, um, and then comparing them to the people of Israel. Most of his oracles are, y'all are not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Turn around or you will go into exile. Like a lot of the prophets, it is a person looking at a whole bunch of people ruining their lives and the lives of the people around you and going, stop, please, literally for the love of God, stop. Oh, you didn't stop. Okay, this is going to go bad. And it does, right? The people that uh, Hosea is talking to are the northern kingdom of Israel. So at some point, there was one nation of Israel, right? Ruled by like David and Solomon. Eventually, they split apart into two kingdoms. One of them is still confusingly named Israel. But weirdly, the one we hear about the most is not the one named Israel. It's the southern kingdom named Judah. That is where Jerusalem is. That is where most of the plot of the Old Testament continues to happen. But we get a few glimpses of the northern kingdom. Hosea is one of those things, glimpses of the northern kingdom. And Hosea is writing as the Assyrians are going to obliterate the northern kingdom, take them all into exile, and they're never going to be the same again. And so most of what he's saying is, please stop. And they don't. And they go into exile. Because they messed up. That's all that stuff in the middle of this passage. Um, in verses uh, 5 through 7, they shall return to the land of Egypt, and, As and Assyria shall be their king because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities. It consumes their oracle priests and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. The Most High they call but he does not raise them up at all because at some point they got warned and warned and warned and like any parent to any child, at some point there has to be a consequence. But what's special about Hosea chapter 11 isn't the, you know, death and damnation that is coming them. That's a lot of Hosea. What's special about Hosea chapter 11 is that we get a very rare glimpse 
into what it is, what it is like to be God. What happens in the very heart of God? We get a little glimpse of God's internal monologue. The prophet's job is to speak for God. And so the prophet gives us this very rare, it's not a whole lot of places in scripture, but it is here. We get a rare insight into what it feels like to be God. In the first few verses of this, we get how tenderly God loves us, that God compares God's self to a loving parent, picking up verses 3 and 4. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was like, I was to them like those who lifted infants their cheek and bent down and fed them. I happened to have an 18-month-old daughter, as most of y'all have picked up on, and we had to, I had to take her to the doctor on a Thursday. She apparently, we didn't know this, hates the doctor, just hates the doctor. And so I have very clearly what it is to have a toddler, like, clinging to you and insisting on being held to your face. It is a deeply tender thing. God deeply and tenderly loves God's people. God deeply and tenderly loves us. And so God feels deep pain when we don't do what we should do, when we don't act right, when we go against God's instructions. That hurts God. Because here is this loving parent who breathed into us the breath of life, who, you know, picked us up, held them in their arms, pressed us to their cheek, taught us to walk, adopted us, you know, welcomed us into their family. And then we do what the people, you know, in the northern kingdom of Israel do, and we don't do what we should. We don't live up to the expectations. We take the love that God gave us and we throw it away. We have fancy theological words for it, like sin and trespasses and whatever, but you can just think of this here in this parental analogy of your parent who loves you dearly, has set some expectations and has communicated to you what those expectations are, communicated to me what those expectations are, and what sin, trespasses, etc. are, is us looking God in the face, knowing the depth of God's love for us, and throwing all that away. And so you can understand why after millennia of trying, God could give up on us. And you could, God would be justified in doing so. God gave us a lot of chances. God gave Israel a lot of chances. God gave God's people a lot of chances. The whole Old Testament is just cycles of them getting chances and doing it right for a while, like I recommitted myself to righteousness after getting caught speeding and getting forgiven, and then them throwing it away over and over and over and over again. That's the big picture of the Old Testament. And each one of those is God who loves them dearly, loves us dearly, being disappointed again and again and again and again. Can you imagine being disappointed in your creation for millennia? It's deeply painful. And so, the powerful words in verses 8 and 9 again, give us that insight into the mind of God. How can I give up on Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adamah? How can I treat you like Zeboim? These are towns that got destroyed alongside Sodom and Gomorrah. My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal. The Holy One is in your midst, and I will not come to wrath. How many of us, after being disappointed for millennia, 
could possibly find it in ourselves to continue to love. And yet that is exactly what happens in the heart of God. God loves God's creation with all that God has. God loves us like a mother raising her newborn toddler, her baby to their cheek. And yet we cast that away constantly. And yet God is God and no mortal. And God continues to love us anyways. There's this theologian that I really like, this guy named William D. Campbell. William D. Campbell is fascinating. He grew up um, in the, the deep rural south, grew up in Mississippi, um, but ended up uh, marching with civil rights leaders and ended up being, you know, I, rereading one of his books right now, John Lewis, um, the longtime congressman from Atlanta um, and civil rights leader, wrote the foreword to his book, right? He ends up being this white dude who becomes, uh, marches with the civil rights folks, uh, but then also realized the best thing he could do to civil rights was talk to racist white people. And so he goes and becomes a chaplain for the KKK as a way of trying to show them the light, um, because he could go into those spaces where a lot of other civil rights leaders could not. And so William D. Campbell, um, who is fascinating and whom I love, uh, was challenged once to summarize the gospel in one sentence, to summarize the, the good news of God in one sentence. Um, and he uses some non-church language, and so I'm going to edit one word in this, and I'm going to warn you, normally I try to quote accurately, but I'm going to quote inaccurately once. Um, I'm going to change a word so that the, you get some other takeaway from this sermon other than Pastor Trey said what. Um, so we're going to not do that. Um, it is all, we are all jerks, and God loves us anyways. We are all jerks, and God loves us anyways. We are all jerks. And also the word that William D. Campbell actually used. We are that too. Starts with a B. Um, you can fill in the blanks. Rhymes with custard. Um, we are all jerks. And God loves us anyways. This is as we think about a journey of discipleship. There are two things we learn from this. One, it is, as Romans 8, 38, and 39 say, that nothing can separate us from the love of God, not even our own boneheaded choices. You have a lifetime of boneheaded choices? Lord knows I do. I find it shocking that I'm a preacher now. A life of boneheaded choices, and yet God still, for some reason, and it is the grace and love and depth of compassion in God, continues to love me. And that's the positive bit. We love that bit. We love the I have been set free. Praise the Lord. We love that. I saw the light. I saw the light. We love it. We love seeing the light. We love being forgiven. But here's the other part. Here's the discipleship part. Now we need to stop hurting the one we love. We love this part where God loves us no matter what. But there's the other side of that coin, and that's the discipleship journey, which is now stop hurting the one you love. You love Jesus with all your heart, might, and strength? You love your neighbor as yourself? Great. We need to stop hurting the one that we love. I am blessed. I learned this lesson actually in my marriage. Marriage is theoretically a place where we're supposed to learn these things. I actually learned it there. In our premarital counseling, so I, hi, Trey, I'm, a, I'm Trey, I'm a chronic workaholic. I'm an absolutely chronic workaholic. You leave me to my own devices, I will work for 21 hours a day, I will sleep for two and a half, I will shower, and I will go back to work. And for many years, I did exactly that. And the pastor, who was my pastor, um, he was supposed to be on my side in our premarital counseling, uh, wanted Sydney to throw me under the bus for being a chronic workaholic. David Heinemann, who was the pastor, I'll throw him under the bus, it's fine. He's apologized to me many years later. Um, our relationship, much better now. Um, he wanted Sydney to throw me under the bus in premarital counseling and say, the amount Trey works is unacceptable and that I'm not going to marry you, if, I think this is his goal, unless you slow the heck down. Instead, what Sydney said was, I see that he's trying. I see that he's trying to do better. Now that's great. I've been set free. I saw the light. I saw... You see why Charles sings and I don't. But 
then I actually had to do better. I was given this chance, right? To not be, not have being a chronic workaholic ruin my marriage. We've been together for 13 years. I clearly made some progress, and it did. But I had to do that, right? I was extended this grace. I had to actually do better. And so when it came time for us to have kids, I stopped traveling abroad four to six months a year. I take at least one day off a week, 80% of the time, which is progress. We have dinner together most evenings. That is, was not my reality 13 years ago. But I had to do both parts, or it's not going to work, right? It's all well and good for her to tell me I'm trying. I have to actually try. It's the same thing with our relationship with God. Have we been set free from our trespasses? Yeah, absolutely. You have. God loves you so much, and God is never going to give up on you. Never. That's how much God loves you, that no matter what you do, no matter what you do, God is going to continue to love you. But we then need to recognize that if God loves us and we love God, we cannot continue to treat the one we love with the deep disrespect. We have to try to get better as a way of loving God. And we may never be able to love God as much as God loved us, but we can at least try. That's the journey of discipleship. Is God loving us and setting us free? And then us being saved, comforted, and challenged by that love to grow and change so that we no longer treat God the way we did before. Because we've seen how much we're loved. And we would never want to treat someone we love that way. Let us pray. Gracious loving God, <laughs> we give you thanks for the astounding depth of your love. We give you thanks for the so many second chances that you have given us. We give you thanks that Jesus died on the cross, that we can have those second chances because of how much you love us. God, forgive us again because we've messed up again. And God, help us to know your sanctifying grace that we may grow closer to you that we may be transformed by you. That we may no longer treat you, the God we love, the way we have been treating you for thousands of years. May we be transformed by the love you have already given us. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen.